Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone here. A big welcome to you all. To commemorate the 10th anniversary of the ILO Domestic Workers Convention, that's Convention 189, today on International Human Rights Day, the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and the International Trade Union ah. Confederation welcomes you to this online forum and the launch of our report, Domestic Work is Work. 10 years ago, the ILO adopted Convention 189 on the rights of domestic workers. Since that groundbreaking step, only 35 countries around the world have ratified the convention, and only nine of which are, are in the Commonwealth. Representing 2.4 billion people across 54 countries, we believe that the Commonwealth can lead the way to ratify and implement Convention 189. In fact, of the last five countries to ratify the convention, four were Commonwealth nations, which indicates that there is some momentum for ratification. Still, uh, more action is urgently needed. The rights of domestic workers are under threat now more than ever. We can see that the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated how vital care work is, yet domestic workers who are mostly women have been among the hardest hit. The pandemic has impacted the already precarious job security for millions of domestic workers. The pandemic just demonstrated their lack of access to social protections and has put domestic workers at greater risk of abuse, exploitation, and trafficking. Given this context, we hope that today's forum will inspire action. We will hear from a range of voices today, from government officials to union leaders and NGO advocates. We will hear about the importance and urgency of ratifying and implementing Convention 189. We will learn about the power of strategic grassroots advocacy to bring about essential change for domestic workers. And we will share resources and strategic actions that you can use when promoting the rights of domestic workers in your countries. Now, before we get started, um, a quick introduction. My name is Sine Arora, and I am the director of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, its London office. And a little bit about the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative for those who may not know us. We are an independent, non-governmental organization working towards the practical realization of human rights. Our head office is currently in India with offices in Ghana as well as, as in London. We work on a variety of um, critical human rights issues, access to justice, right to information, media freedoms. And here in London, we have a global program that contributes to the eradication of contemporary forms of slavery, forced labor, and human trafficking. And our work here focuses on uh, conducting evidence-based research, creating coalitions, and strengthening networks and strategic advocacy. We founded and are currently secretariat to the Commonwealth 8.7 Network a global network of 60 plus local civil society organizations that share a common vision to eradicate modern slavery and human trafficking. I know that uh, some of our members are here today and they work on these vital issues that we will be discussing today. So to get us started, I would like to introduce to you all Mr. Guy Ryder, who is the Director General of the International Labor Organization. And he has kindly recorded some brief words for us for today's event. In 2011, the ILO adopted the seminal Domestic Workers Convention to promote decent work for domestic workers and to recognize their invaluable contribution to the global economy. Guy Ryder will take us through the enormity of this moment 10 years ago and the weight of its importance today. 10 years ago, the world of work took a historic step forward. Governments, workers and employers organizations adopted a groundbreaking new ILO convention, number 189. In doing so, they affirmed that domestic work is like any other kind of work and that domestic workers are entitled to the same rights and protections as other workers. Since then, the Domestic Workers Convention has served as the bedrock for progress on the rights and conditions of domestic workers. In many countries, labour and social protection laws have been extended to cover them. But it is no secret that we remain far from achieving what is needed. 
So far, just 35 countries have ratified the Convention. In the Commonwealth, only five of the 54 member states have brought it into force, although it is pending in another four. Increasing this rate of ratification must be a priority for us all. Worldwide, there are more than 75 million domestic workers. The vast majority are women. Eight out of ten of them are still informally employed. And this is important because informal economy workers are less likely to have job security, social protection or emergency income support. During the COVID-19 crisis, we know that job losses among domestic workers have, on average, been three times higher than in other sectors. So the impact on domestic workers and their families has been devastating. And there is a particular irony here, because the pandemic has shown us just how important care work is for all of us. Domestic workers are an essential part of the infrastructure that allows households to meet their care needs. In particular, domestic workers help their employers, many of whom are women, to work in the paid labour market. They make a contribution to gender equality that benefits us all. And as populations age, demand for care services is going to grow, meaning that we will need more care workers in the future. So ensuring that these jobs are decent jobs is vital if we are to achieve the goal of decent work for all. Trade unions have made great strides in organising domestic workers, despite the challenges of reaching women and men who are often isolated in households and sometimes have limited freedom of movement. During the pandemic, those unions also provided valuable practical support, delivering food and personal protective equipment to their members, including to those who had lost their jobs because of the crisis. But this is not enough. We must do better, and we can. That's why it would be so important for more governments to ratify Convention 189 and to fully implement its provisions. And governments also need to be more ambitious about formalising employment in domestic work. This will help to improve the wages and the working conditions of domestic workers and give them the same core rights as other workers. And in particular, governments must pay more attention to ending child labour in domestic work. This is just one thing that we must do if we are to meet the United Nations global goal of eliminating child labour by 2030. Convention 189 has provisions on this and progress on formalising the sector will certainly help. Domestic work is work and domestic workers must have the same rights and protections as all other workers. And this means that as we work to build a human-centred recovery from this crisis, we must ensure that domestic workers are not left behind. We'd like to thank Mr. Guy Ryder, who's the Director General of the ILO for his inspiring words. Convention uh, 189 is in fact a bedrock for domestic workers' rights and is absolutely essential that its provisions are implemented globally if we are to ensure domestic work is created, treated the same as work in other sectors. Uh, very quickly, I wish to point out that since the video was, was recorded, we have the fabulous news that Namibia has now brought the convention into force. In fact, this happened in the last day, which means that six Commonwealth countries have brought Convention 189 into force in their countries, and only three uh, remain, three that have ratified have yet to bring the convention into force. Now we will get started with our panel. Our esteemed guests today represent a range of countries from around the globe. From nations that show some indication of being on the brink of ratification, like Uganda and the UK, to countries where Convention 189 has already been ratified, such as South Africa and Jamaica. Our speakers also represent a range of stakeholders, government, unions, NGOs, which underlines that human rights protection undoubtedly requires a multi-sectoral approach. 
We will hear from our speakers on both the successes and challenges they have experienced in the process of ratifying and implementing Convention 189, and will suggest a path forward for action. My co-moderator today, who will uh, lead us on in this uh, with the panel discussion, is uh, Marie Marika Koning, policy advisor at the International Trade Union Confederation. Marika is an expert on gender equality policies, programs, and campaigns, and she was the secretary of the workers' group when ILO Convention 189 and the Recommendation 201 were negotiated and adopted in 2012. I'd like to turn the floor over to Marie Kay and invite you to share your views on the importance of the Domestic Workers' Convention and also to introduce our esteemed panelists. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Shinea, I, because this is an important issue. And uh, as Guy Ryder actually importantly stated, uh, domestic work is work. And uh, this is exactly the reason why ILO Convention 189 and ILO Recommendation 201 are of critical importance. Domestic workers are workers and take on a range of responsibilities in a private household. They cook, clean the house, do laundry, care for children, the elderly or persons with disabilities and many more other tasks. However, their work is not valued and recognized in law since their work is considered as work traditionally performed by women. And since the majority of domestic workers are women and belonging to marginalized groups, these ILO standards are a critical step too to advance gender equality in the world of work and ensure women's equal rights and protections under the law and advance the care economy agenda to ensure decent care jobs and the creation of millions of care jobs. The adoption, as Guy Ryder pointed out very well, um, the adoption of ILO Convention 189 and, and Recommendation 206 are truly historical. They form a strong recognition of the economic and social value of domestic work, the rights they should enjoy in law and practice, and include critical measures to limit and eliminate their abusive and exploitative working conditions. ILO Convention 189 is a binding instrument. This means when governments ratify the convention, they need to align their laws and policies accordingly. And the ILO Recommendation 201 is a non-binding instrument. However, it builds on the provisions of the convention and is therefore a very important tool to ensure the effective implementation of ILO Convention 189. The instruments provide a floor on the minimum, minimum rights and protections domestic workers should enjoy. They recognize, for instance, the employment relationship, whether they work on a part-time basis or work for multiple employers. They cover living um, domestic workers and migrant domestic workers. And um, those are often the ones most at risk to be trapped in precarious and abusive employment. And the employer can be a member of the household, but it can also be a recruitment agency that employs domestic workers and makes them available to a household. So the rights of domestic workers yeah, include uh, the right to a minimum wage, uh, social protection, um, the right to have a contract and uh, to regulate their uh, working hours and very important win. Um, and I still remember the day of the adoption of uh, ILO Convention 189, um, that the right of, for, of one day off for domestic workers was secured, as well other um, regulations um, of, of working time. So this was a big win as well. And it also includes protections from abusive practices by private employment agencies and um, measures for occupational health and safety. It addresses the elimination of forced labor and the effective abolition of child labor, uh, child domestic labor. And last but not least, and it's not inclusive, but very important to point out, it also includes the right to freedom of association and collective bargaining, which are key for domestic workers to join and form a trade union to bargain collectively for improved wages and decent working conditions. 
So Convention 189 and Recommendation 201 were made by domestic workers, by the power of the domestic workers movement. They lobbied and campaigned vigorously to secure its adoption 10 years ago, followed by a collective call and global campaign for the wide ratification of ILO Convention 189. ILO Convention 189 is all about the power of domestic workers who united in unions, supported by unions of the ITUC and a number of global unions to achieve change through social dialogue and collective bargaining. And as reflected in the recent ILO report, since the adoption of ILO Convention 189, the lives of millions of domestic workers changed and saw recognition of their rights in law and practice, improved wages and working conditions, regulation of working time, the right to access social protection and more, thanks to law and policy reforms in multiple countries. However, as well stated by Guy Ryder in his video, there's still millions of domestic workers who are left behind and outside the labor law. Reason why they are hit hard uh, so much during the COVID-19 pandemic, leading to um, enormous job loss and income loss and being left out from COVID-19 response packages. This underpins once more the critical importance to make ILO Convention 189 a reality and why it is of critical importance to ensure the wide ratification of Convention 189. And now it is for me an honor to introduce you to our dear panelists who will share with us how we can move forward with the wide ratification of ILO Convention 189 and its effective implementation. I will first introduce the panelists one by one, and then I will start asking uh, the questions. So I would like to first um, introduce um, Avril uh, Sharp. Avril is um, a policy and casework uh, officer at Calian, the UK's leading uh, charity providing advice, advocacy and support to migrant domestic workers. She trained as an immigration lawyer, specializing in representing victims of trafficking, torture and gender-based persecution. And Avril is an advisor providing direct support to domestic workers. She leads on Kalayan's uh, policy and campaign work to improve the conditions and protections of domestic workers in the UK. And the next one is Vriti Lydia. She's um, uh, a seasoned and experienced human rights development law lawyer. She currently works as a director of programs at Platform for Labour Action in Uganda. And the PLA is a national civil society organization focused on promoting and protecting the rights of vulnerable and marginalized workers through empowerment of communities and individuals in Uganda. And um, the uh, next panelist will be Myrtle Whitboy. She's the uh, leading South African labor activist and the uh, founder and current uh, president of the International Domestic Workers Federation, the only global uh, federation led by women. And she's also the general secretary of the South African Domestic uh, Service and Allied Workers Union, Satsawu. Uh, and Myrtle began organizing domestic workers in apartheid South Africa and continues to do so today, fighting for wage increase, social protection, recognition of domestic work as work through the adoption or ratification of ILO uh, Convention 189 and uh, a global victory that was also achieved through the tireless efforts of domestic workers. And last but not least, we have also present in our panel, the Honorable uh, Minister uh, Carl Su Samudu, Samuda. And um, Carl Samuda is uh, best known as a veteran politician, a minister of labor and social security. He previously served as minister of other uh, ministries like of education, youth and information. And um, he also, um, um, let me see, he also served as a minister of state in earlier uh, administrations and is the former general secretary of the Jamaica Labour Party. 
and has also been the member of um, Parliament for St. Andrew, North Central since 1980, and has the distinction of representing both major political parties in that constituency. He's one of uh, the only two members of Parliament who has the distinction of winning 10 cons consecutive general um, elections. So, um, uh, Minister, um, we have really the honor that you uh, are present here during this panel. So I would like to ask you um, one of the first questions um, during this panel. And um, and it starts with uh, yeah, the important uh, fact that J Jamaica actually ratified ILO Convention 189 in 2016. So what we would like to know is what led to the ratification of ILO Convention 189 in 2016. What role did um, civil society and unions play in this um, uh, in this ratification process and in advancing re reforms for domestic workers? Minister Carl uh, Samuda, you have the floor. You have to turn on your sound and video. Do you hear me? Um, ah. oh, okay. Sorry. I think I think I think I'm back up. So somebody had turned me off. Okay. But I first would like to say that notwithstanding the the, the, the rude interruptions, I think we're going just fine. And I'm not yes. perturbed by it in the slightest. Yes. Um, you asked me why did we? Because of the dynamic representation that has been made over the years by the president of the local union in Jamaica, uh, Ms. Price, who has been a, a, a dynamo in, in uh, promoting the well being of the domestic workers in Jamaica. And she continues to serve tirelessly in this role, along with the rest of her team and the support of the government. And we find that the whole, as explained by you, the whole process is one of absolute uh, importance, especially at this time. Now, I had a prepared presentation to make to you. Do I make it at this time or do I do it after? Yeah, please go ahead. You can just continue. Yeah. Just continue. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, as you probably know, down through the years, the role of the household worker has been vital to the proper upbringing of our children in Jamaica. And I dare say um, it, it is not unusual for this to be the case in other countries. Um, because it is through the relationship within the household of a domestic helper that uh, there are memories, fond memories developed um, as the children grow and become responsible citizens. And most of their early development started with their relationship in the home with the domestic helper. In my own experience, I can tell you that their assistance to me was invaluable. Um, so 2021 marks the, the, the 10th anniversary of the Domestic Workers Convention, uh, C189, and the fifth year since Jamaica ratified the, 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 the convention, for which we are very proud. As we celebrate Human Rights Day today, I'm honored to be with you speaking about Jamaica's progress in protecting the rights of this critical but vulnerable group. I'm also pre very proud to know that our progress has been noted in the new report on the Domestic Workers Convention um, amendments. And since ratifying C-189, we have uh, commenced amendments uh, to the Minimum Wage Act to provide additional protection to domestic households. The primary objective, of course, is to get them from informality to a formal arrangement um, within their, 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 their sector. We are replacing the term household worker, by the way, with domestic worker to ensure consistency with 
189. We will require all employers to keep a record of the terms and conditions of employment. And these, the, will, this will include name and address of employer and worker, the start date of uh, the contract and employment, the wages to be paid, the statutory deductions, which of course everyone will have to pay because that's part of being a responsible member of an organization. Um, leave entitlement. This, you know, has been so informal that it's a matter of when it's convenient for the employer without regard sometimes for the convenience to the worker. This provides greater protection for domestic workers in the events uh, also of dispute. Um, we are mandating that employers pay domestic workers at regular intervals. Employers will also be mandated to provide workers with pay slips, clearly outlining their statutory obligations. Um, and that is a part of, of making it the, the, the level, bringing to it the level of formalization that is required. We are looking at um, the passing of legislation to introduce national insurance. Um, this is a scheme by deductions to ensure that workers have access to social protection upon their retirement. Many uh, persons who fall into this category of employment are, are, are usually, or I wouldn't say usually as much now as in the past, but in the past they were just simply discarded, um, used, uh, abused and discarded. This um, we have brought by and large uh, to an end and we are moving from here now to make them a very respected and responsible group that we will uh, treat in, in the same way that we treat other workers in, in vital uh, areas of employment. This um, is often deducted by employers, as I said, and uh, not paid, uh, leaving workers without the benefit of recourse. It's one thing to have a provision for it, a deduction to be made, but it must be made with a purpose. And it must be made with a level of protection that if not complied with, then there is recourse. Um, we are also amending the employment agency regulations, mandating that domestic workers uh, who are recruited and placed in jobs overseas by agencies are provided with written job offers or contracts um, of or contacts rather um, and contracts of employment um, and personnel prior to their departure. They cannot just be going off in the hope that uh, when they arrive, they will the conditions of employment will be satisfactory and and they have all the information they need. By the way, I might just, uh, if I'm allowed, I don't know if I have time, but I will just tell you that this is not a new subject for me because while at university, I was part of the, uh, I won't call the name of the country where I went to university, but it's in North America. And I was part of a group of us who sought to protect the interests of our domestic workers at that period that were brought to uh, that country and in many instances were abused. And um, so we, we, we sought out to protect them in, in, in as much as, as we could by bringing the situation to public attention. So as I say, this is not a new subject for me. And it's, I, I come to the subject with great passion and commitment. Um, workers should also be in possession of their passports and other documents at all times as protection against the likelihood of human trafficking. Um, we have a strong relationship with, the, with, with, our, with our union in, in ensuring that they comply with all the requirements that will give them protection and will bring them respect. Um, our president, Mrs. Ms. Price, is, is, is in this forum. I understand she's participating later on. She's a dynamo, and it's someone who I have a great amount of respect for. She has come a journey in life, and she continues tirelessly to give of herself in the interest of this category of worker. Um, they were integral in the ratification of 189, and as I mentioned before, that's the reason why we're 
that we ratified because of the dynamic representation of the group headed by Ms. Price. Uh, last year, the Ministry of Labor and Social Security signed an MOU with the union, which will allow domestic workers to seek employment using the ministry's employment database. So we have literally partnered with them in a structured and organized manner, not in a sort of loose here and here and approach, but in a structured approach. Um, through this partnership, the ministry will provide quality job opportunities with proper uh, checks and appropriate due diligence, which is an essential part of this exercise. It will create a safer job seeking mechanism that can be monitored to reduce the likelihood of violations of the relevant labor laws by employers. So often we have labor laws that on, on paper look very impressive, but at the workplace it gets abused. And so it's important that we monitor the activities at the workplace and that we are prepared with a, with a, with a formal structure to address these abuses. Uh, this partnership will also contribute to a reduction in the possibility of domestic servitude, uh, particularly against women and girls in our society. For too long, um, women were made to feel in a certain category as if they were lesser beings. What we want to ensure is that there is respect at the workplace and there is respect for the person um, who is uh, carrying out the, the, the duties at the workplace. And so the ILO transition um, from informality to formality is, is something that is critical to the way forward. Just last week, we launched the ILO's transition from informality to formality action platform uh, for domestic workers and uh, fisher folk in Jamaica. Okay. Under this initiative, the ILO is supporting our efforts to formalize the domestic worker sector through the provision of uh, training and, and grants. And I'd uh, like to... Minister, just to say, uh, really, it's so rich, your contributions. If you, I can give you another one or two minutes to close. Uh, oh, I'll close within a minute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, commitment to improving the position of the workers in Jamaica is so near and dear to me that I get carried away whenever I speak about it. Can I'd, I'd also like to thank the ILO for their continued support. We take the decent work agenda very seriously. And um, the, the transition from the sector of for, from in, informality to formality um, dignifies and gives pride to the entire sector. So I wish to thank you for this opportunity. I could go on talking about this subject for an hour, but um, time is of course very important. So thank you all very much. And I wish you all the very best in your deliberations today. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Minister. Your contribution was very compelling and very rich and also um, particularly reflecting on the fact how it, how it became really something where you have been been promoting and supporting for such a long time and um, actually your contribution demonstrates uh, is actually an excellent example of how to effectively implement ILO convention 189 um, you mentioned all the key aspects such as uh, contract and uh, paying in regular intervals and um, uh, also uh, rules, um, employment agencies should take into account and this whole range. So this was really a very rich contribution from your side and we thank you very much. And we really are very supportive of uh, the support and the work you're doing right now. And also that you pointed to Shirley, the important role of her and many in the domestic workers um, community and movement know Shirley very well for her um, excellent leadership she took uh, with her union to also advance the rights and protections of domestic workers. And we are very happy and proud that she's attending um, this uh, webinar today as well. Um, so we might, if, if time allows later on, we might have time to come back to you with another question, Minister. So, um, but, uh, but now I would like to continue with uh, the next panelist on our list. That is um, Myrtle Whitboy, 
and Myrtle Whitboy, as I said, is the president of uh, the International um, Domestic Workers uh, Federation. Myrtle, are you able to turn on your camera and um, and your sound? Thank Great. you. Great. That's better this way. And uh, thank you so much, Myrtle, for being here with us. Um, you have been, um, you are actually, you have been fighting for over 40 years for the rights and protections of domestic workers and your story and your um, forceful advocacy and lobby has gone all over the world. So um, I would like to, to ask you uh, a few questions. And that is that um, South Africa ratified the convention in 2013 and um, you and Satsawa were at the forefront of advocating for domestic workers' rights in South Africa. And as a result, the government enacted several laws for domestic workers' rights early on. And, um, and it was actually also the, one of the first countries to ratify C-189. So what lessons, what lessons can be learned from your experience in South Africa and also within the context of all your work done so far in the past 40 years? <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to say in South Africa, I would like to say we were to uh, call the minister in Jamaica for his contribution. It is well appreciated that you are working so closely with Shirley. We appreciate it very much. Yes, you know, many things went through my mind today. It takes me back to when domestic workers actually take control of the ILO, when we were fighting for our own labor rights, when we were standing up and made our voices be heard. Of course, it has been a struggle. Of course, it's been a long road. In South Africa, after coming back, uh, you know, from the ILO, after coming back from Geneva, it was still a tough time to convince our government actually to implement and take stock of what is happening at the ILO. Although our government was most progressive, they were supporting everything that's happening at the ILO. But like uh, the previous minister said, Carl, that yes, sometimes it's just on paper and there's no implementation actually when it comes to the country. However, Satsau has been very active, been very vocal. We have set up meetings with our government. We went to see our government. We went to have sit-ins. We have everything possible and sending daily emails to our government. Of course, the 16th of June, 2013, we were surprised and everything when our government came back to us and said, well, now we've got Convention 189. Well, it was great because South Africa is already in the forefront with labor laws for, South, for domestic workers. We've got our own uh, basic conditions of employment act. We've got our own unemployment fund. We've got our own labor relations act, which means domestic workers can also lay down tools when there's things happening in the country. But of course, the most important one that was still excluding domestic workers was the compensation act, which is COIDA. And that that at, at least was a big battle over the last six years and over the last two years, it has become so intense that the domestic workers in South Africa, we decide to take our minister to court, which, were, which was not very pleasant, but that was the only way that our minister will listen to the voice of the workers and yes. It was proof in South Africa that actually excluding domestic workers in the compensation fund is, is discrimination and also it is unconstitutional. That was indeed a big victory for the domestic workers in South Africa. At the moment, we've got now COIDA, we are registered, domestic workers have started to register, the employees have started to register, the employers, the, the employee, and it is going smooth, but it is simply still on paper. And what is that Sawu doing now in South Africa? We are currently working around the clock with thousands of pamphlets on educating domestic workers on their labor rights, not only on COIRA, on the Convention 189, on the Unemployment Fund. 
and we also set up several WhatsApp videos. We, we have actually started a video on the unemployment fund and domestic workers have access to that. Because one thing about domestic workers, when you become a domestic worker, and recently all employers are giving uh, cell phones for their workers, especially now also with the COVID-19 to keep in touch with their workers. So we have setting up video calls on our, our cell phones and we have actually sent videos out to the worker to say, you know, what you have to press and then you get some information. We have just released also a one on COIDA to educate domestic workers. And we have found out now in South Africa, yes, we are lucky, like you say, we've got all the labor laws, but it's the implementation and how to reach the workers. And we also find that the last three, two and a half years have actually created a setback for domestic workers in the world and in South Africa, because domestic workers was not technology inclined, domestic workers did not really understand the value and the impact of the cell phone. So what are we currently doing also in South Africa? We've now started to actually give training. We call it the technical world. And we start putting training and we start giving training to domestic workers of how to understand your cell phone and how to be able to access things on your cell phone. This is a small one that started now, but at the moment we already went through 75 workers that has been on this and we are going to have in the new year much more workers. That in, in factual fact, that is the only way we are now going to be able to reach domestic workers. We have to start preparing ourselves in South Africa and we have to start preparing ourselves in the world of the new world of COVID-19 and how we won't let domestic workers mess up on what is there for them. So this is a very new challenge we are facing in South Africa, but we are also facing it in the world. But we are hoping that as we go forward, also uh, the next big step that happened in South Africa, this year, two months ago, the Department of Labor has set up a meeting with Tatsau and we now signed a, 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 a contract with the Department of Labor that we will work together in future on all aspects that is involved domestic workers. Nothing will be discussed with our domestic workers. We sign a legal agreement with the Department of Labor. We also were very pleased on the 28th of November when the president of the country for the first time addressed domestic workers. And at that um, addressing the president assured domestic workers that many more inspectors will be employed now for the domestic sector and the inspectors will work closely with Satsau and with us when they go to households, they will let Satsau accompany them. That is also one step forward. The next step that the president also said, currently in South Africa, domestic workers earn slightly less than the national minimum wage. Now the president has also put that on the table that domestic workers will now earn a living wage, the same wage act as from the end of January. But like we say, that was the president speaking. We still have to go to the labor department. So what we did, we had a follow up with the labor department and about a week ago, the labor department has addressed the National Executive Committee of Satsau and there he is actually saying, yes, this is going to happen in the new year. We are going to, you are going to get a new wage and you will also, we will also employ more inspectors. We also work closely together with the CCMA. The CCMA represent domestic workers and Satsawa is allowed to go in there to represent the worker on behalf of the worker. And what has happened that the domestic, the CCMA has now also reached some agreement with Satsawa to work closely together and to see how we can actually, you know, but and the next step also is that there's so many things happening in South Africa. It's been quite a busy year. But the, but the most important part is that this all happened now within the two years of COVID-19. Yes. And that is what is so impressive that 
Yeah. We see all the loopholes, we see all what we couldn't do, and then we could catch up on all that. So this is the way forward in South Africa at the moment. We are working closely together with our Department of Labor. We are also working on together with other organizations on having a social grant for to all workers in South Africa. And that's what they call a basic income grant. Tatsawa has also put their voice to that. And we are hoping that in the next week, we will have a discussion with all involved. And we are hoping that the 350 grant, the rank grant, will now go up to 500. So even there, Tatsawa is involved. And yes, we are very much involved in the technical program together with the university social law project in South Africa. And we are hoping that we will extend much more in the new year. So currently South Africa is very fortunate in, in the labor laws. We've got all the labor laws now. At the moment, we also heard last week that our minister has now the deposit 190. And we're hoping that once that is ratified, that we put 189 and 190 together and we will be so powerful for domestic workers to speak up. But like it, the most important part is it should be in the hands of the workers and not in the hands of the process. And that is what we aim now, to make Thank education you. available for domestic workers. And that is where we are now in South Africa. Thank you, Marika. Thank you. Thank you, Myrtle. And uh, this is uh, such an inspiring um, contribution you are sharing, Myrtle, with us. It shows the power of unions. It shows the power of organizing and how inventive dom domestic workers are in finding effective ways to respond even to a crisis like the pandemic and that you're now working on organizing tools by using um, yeah, uh, cell phones, but also that you uh, have shown to be determined and um, in the midst of a crisis, achieving um, so many important um, uh, protections and rights for domestic workers. It's uh, really impressive um, the way forward in, uh, in South Africa and a great example for the world and for all Commonwealth countries to follow. So thank you so much, Myrtle. Uh, when time allows, I will get back to you as well uh, for, for a last uh, question. But thank you. Thank you so much for your very rich um, contribution. Um, I will go and move to the next panelist, and this is, um, uh, which is uh, Miss uh, Avril, Avril Sharp from Kalyan. Um, I hope you can turn on your camera too. Yes, great. Welcome, Avril. And um, so um, <clears throat> great that you are also part of this, uh, this panel. And uh, I have also a few questions for you. Um, your organization assists um, migrant domestic workers in the UK, as well as advocates for reforms to the overseas domestic workers visa framework. And can you speak um, to the specific vulnerabilities that migrant domestic workers face in the, in the UK? And also um, you are dealing with a government particularly hostile to migration. What have you found to be the most effective way of advocating with the UK government and getting them to respond uh, to your concerns? And what lessons uh, have you learned from engaging with this government? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you um, to the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative for inviting Kalyan to speak today. Um, I think unlike some of the other speakers um, in the UK, because um, we have had a very um, restrictive visa regime um, that applies to migrant domestic workers for um, approaching almost 10 years now, um, next April will be the 10 year anniversary. I think there is a um, collective understanding that domestic workers um, don't actually have um, any rights. So um, whilst it's, it's, it's very interesting to hear the, the comparison between the work being done by some of the other uh, Commonwealth countries on the call to make sure that the workers, domestic workers are aware of what rights they have to make sure that they can exercise them. Um, whereas in the UK, we have the, the opposite situation, which is where domestic workers have um, 
hardly any rights whatsoever. Uh, since April 2012, domestic workers are admitted to the UK on a visa that essentially um, ties them to the employer that they accompany to the UK. And um, whilst there were some changes made um, five years ago in 2016, because Callianne, together with our allies, including um, grassroots organisations and unions as well, which play a huge role in the fight in the UK, um, there were some um, important concessions that the UK government recognised that domestic workers who are in abusive working conditions uh, may well need an escape route from abuse. Um, so in their eyes, they consider that the visa is no longer tied to the worker. However, what they fail to recognize is that domestic workers need time to be able to safely change employer and find safe um, re-employment elsewhere. So the situation we have in the UK is that domestic workers are allowed to change employer, but only for so long as their original um, visa is issued. Their visa is issued for a maximum of six months. They don't arrive at um, international airports in the UK with six months to spare. They arrive with less than six months. Uh, by the time that they may find the courage in order to uh, flee an abusive employer, perhaps without possession of their documents, not being able to speak the language and not knowing where they're going to stay, you know, a safe place for them to stay, um, once they leave, um, lots of them don't know that they um, perhaps might be able to change employer, but even those that do, and even those that escape with possession of their passport, find themselves in a situation where they can only lawfully remain um, working in the UK until their visa expires. So for lots of workers that come to Kalyan, we are an advice organisation. For the majority, we are the first uh, port of call or the first place where they receive um, regulated immigration advice about what their options are in the UK and in a high number of cases by the time they come to us um, their, their visa has already uh, expired. So the visa regime only serves to compound the existing vulnerabilities that migrant domestic workers have um, in the UK. Um, I could speak more but I'm aware of time so I'll move on to the other questions. Um, we are dealing with a hugely hostile government um, to migrants. Um, I don't want to um, veer too far off um, the, the topic of domestic workers uh, today, but we at the moment have a, um, a, a piece of law that's passing through um, our, our parliament at the moment that seeks to criminalise those who are fleeing war and persecution. So it's an incredibly difficult time for domestic workers. For a very long time, our um, government, who've been in power now for the last 10 years, have made very unhelpful assertions about a good migrant and a bad migrant, someone who's highly skilled and someone who's low uh, considered low skill. At Callianne, we say that domestic work is highly skilled work, it's multi-skilled work. These workers do incredibly vulnerable, important work, without which we wouldn't be able to function as a country. Um, I think the pandemic has, in a lot of cases, helped us demonstrate that. Um, I know of workers who are employed by NHS workers, who without a domestic worker working for them would not be able to go out and, um, you know, battle on the on the front line in terms of coronavirus without their domestic worker uh, working for them back in their in their house. Um, in terms of lessons, I'm still learning all the time. Um, that's why um, uh, events like this are hugely important for us to be able to learn from our um, international colleagues. I think um, one of the, the bigger things that I have um, learned in my time at uh, Callianne is that, um, and this applies to um, uh, the ratification of Convention 189 and the government's continued stance on not reinstating um, the visa for domestic workers um, prior to 2012, which gave them certain basic fundamental rights, which meant that they could challenge abuse when it arose. Um, lots of the reasons that we are given by the government essentially don't stand up to scrutiny. They are not borne out by um, facts or by law or by logic. So um, a lot of our time is trying to um, strike through those reasons and explain to our supporters um, why they don't stand up to 
scrutiny um, because I think um, there have been a number of instances over the last few years where we have seen in the UK that there is huge amounts of um, solidarity and strength and compassion with migrant populations. Um, so um, part of our role at Callianne, we see it is very important as educating the public about the, um, the mistruths that the government continue to push forward as reasons not to reinstate uh, rights for domestic workers. So um, in short, it is an ongoing um, battle in the UK, but one we have no intention of losing. Um, we have a number of, I'm aware that there are a number of people on the call from the UK um, and others who um, continue to work with Callianne and um, a group of allies um, to make sure that we won't stop until domestic workers have their rights returned to them. Thank you very much and happy Human Rights Day. Thank you so much, uh, Eva, for your, um, as well, very important contribution, which um, particularly highlights um, all the um, challenges migrant domestic workers are facing in particular, particularly when they are not aware of their rights. And hopefully, uh, I hope that this webinar and the report being published and uh, the work and follow up after this webinar will be a good um, po uh, yeah, moment to maybe reinforce again the call to uh, for the ratification and effective implementation of ILO Convention 189. And uh, I know there are many uh, in the UK out there active. I see also some have joined us uh, during this webinar. So I wish you all, um, you know, a lot of support and, uh, and solidarity in your work to move this forward so that all that all domestic workers, including migrant domestic workers, have all the rights they should enjoy as any other worker. So thank you very much, Avery. And um, I will go, uh, maybe I might go back later on, but I will now go to the, the last, um, but not least speaker on the panel. And that is um, Miss uh, Buiti Lydia. Uh, and she is um, from the uh, PLA in Uganda. So I hope that you can turn on your camera and, uh, and your sound. Great. Okay. Great. Right. Uh, That's you. great. Thank you. And uh, yeah, it's also an honor to have you here with us, uh, Witty Lydia, um, during this panel. So we also have a uh, few important questions to ask to you. Um, Uganda is actually uh, close to um, ratifying ILO Convention 189, and the government is working with your organization and others to determine the extent of reforms needed to ensure compliance with ILO Convention 189. And <clears throat> we would, um, it would be great if you could share how this process is going. And um, also, if you think that you believe that Ugandan government will follow through with its commitment to ratify ILO Convention 189. Um, and uh, so what your views or your take on, on that is uh, from your perspective. And what are the next steps you have in, in place to um, ensure the ratification of the convention? You have the floor, mm -hmm. Betty, Lydia. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I want to congratulate the previous speakers. Um, they are more in a more, I think, lucky position than Uganda with regard to uh, legal protection of domestic workers. Uh, but like you noted, the government of Uganda uh, since 2000, 2000, 2020, 2020 um, kickstarted the process of uh, ratification. And of course, this particular process was as a result of uh, uh, endless and continuous um, advocacy engagement with the government and trying to uh, create consensus and, uh, and appreciation of the need to, uh, first of all, uh, organize domestic workers work within uh, the legal framework of the country. Although when you look at generally the legal framework of the country, uh, there is, it has a generic application, uh, application to all workers. 
But of course, there are those uh, provisions of the laws, especially in the Employment Act, where uh, you find that domestic workers, actually we don't refer to them as domestic workers in the law, they are referred to as uh, domestic servants, uh, which ideally you know, already makes them you know, a servant of someone, uh, mm -hmm. some sort of like servitude and everything. So because of that advocacy, continuous advocacy, of course, uh, by platform for labor action, but also other uh, organizations like uh, uh, labor unions coming on board, but also even the domestic workers themselves, now that we have been able to work with them to try to organize so they are able to self-influence on this particular issue. So in 2020, the government kick-started the process. Of course, this process has, um, I may say, it has been an inclusive one for starters. At least we are seeing a tripartite uh, process plus CSO uh, process, uh, because sometimes uh, the tripartite process uh, locks out certain um, as stakeholders in the ongoing process around ratification, but this particular process has uh, actually had to expand and add on as stakeholders to come on board. And uh, the, um, the Solicitor General was able to give um, a clearance uh, to the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development to go ahead and uh, kickstart the process of ratifying because this kickstarted with the cabinet memo, which had to be approved and through the justifications why the need to ratify this particular convention. So with that clearance, uh, we've set the process. And also I'm, I must know that now we have the national uh, sort of like working group that is working on the process of uh, ratification. So that is sort of like the indicator. But ideally also maybe to add, of course, when you ask me and say, uh, are we sure that the government will come through with this particular commitment? Because I know that in 2016, the government of Uganda actually committed uh, during the, the universal periodic review to, to ratifying this particular convention. But of course, by the time of our next peer review, again, uh, we hadn't yet ratified. So even us were wondering, okay, did the process start in 2020 because of the upcoming peer review uh, or is actually a genuine one? But we can also look at the other indicators that actually showing us that um, indeed, as a government, I think following the, the research and the advocacy, um, all those efforts, I think the government feels uh, that it is the high time to protect such categories of workers. But I also want to give just a quick background why the government at this point in time, we feel that it will come through. One, uh, as you may aware, uh, Uganda, we are exporting labor, uh, mostly to the Gulf countries. And majority of the people who are going in these countries are actually going to work as domestic workers. So, and of course there have been issues around that particular area where people are reporting uh, uh, instances of, um, you know, uh, modern day slavery, uh, trafficking in person and all that. So because of the pressure that is coming with that particular aspect, it also, I think, makes the government to be ready to want to have this commitment made at the international level. The other aspect that we have seen or the indicator that we see or we want to link on that actually the government is committing in terms of ratifying, but also trying to domesticate some of those provisions in the convention uh, back home. Um, again, in 2020, the same year, uh, the government uh, approached platform for the action that we work on the regulation, uh, the employment domestic workers regulation at 2020. And what we did at that point in time, uh, I being the, the lead counsel on that particular project, were able to ensure that the provisions of the regulations actually mirror the provisions of the ILO Convention Number 189. So that particular, those particular regulations having been initiated by the government itself, and the fact that they are carrying them forward, the discussion, they are going through the different stages. I think for me, that is a very good indicator that should sure the government will come through. Yes. Uh, and maybe just on the other part where you, um, what next ideally, uh, what next uh, for us to ensure ratification? Uh, because we sit on the national, on, on the national working group. Sorry about that. Sorry, I don't know what's happening. Oh my God. We don't hear anything. So you can just, uh... 
<clears throat> finish what you <laughs> oh sorry okay so because we still, we're still on the national working group uh so what is happening is that um the we are coming up with cons the consultation process with other stakeholders to be able to appreciate one thing we must uh, note is that uh, we've just come out of the general election, and therefore we have a new legislature arm, arm of government, but also uh, a somewhat new executive arm of government. So that in, uh, in itself calls for us to be able to uh, sensitize them, but also uh, make them appreciate why specifically we need this particular um, convention to be ratified, because um, once it is ratified, normally there has to be a domest uh, domestication uh, documentation uh, instrument that has to domesticate this particular instrument uh, ratification. So that is what we are planning to do in terms of undertaking consultative sensitizing sessions, targeting the new policymakers, but also the executive wing as well. Of course, as well as the, the other stakeholders that have been very key in this particular area. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Riti, uh, uh, Lydia, for your uh, for your contributions and uh, knowing that, uh, yeah, it, it, that you you're coming close there now after a lot of efforts and 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 de determination to bring the government closer to uh, make C-189 a reality for domestic workers, which is of so key importance. Um, so um, and actually we, we're coming to the end of this this panel. So I'd like to thank you. I like to thank uh, Myrtle, um, the minister who spoke, uh, Carl Samuro Muda, who had unfortunately to leave because of um, urgent other matters to deal with, um, and April Sharp of Galan. So we thank all of you very much for your contributions, um, which really reflected, you know, the power um, of uh, the domestic workers, and um, it it's still a long way to go, but um, because of the power of the domestic workers movement, but also because of the power of unions, um, a lot of changes have happened. While challenges still uh, remain, as we also have heard from uh, the speakers um, as well. So that's why it's very important that we all unite behind the domestic workers movement, the IDWF, the unions, to make sure that um, C-190, C-189 becomes a reality for all domestic workers in the world. And, um, and for that, um, the domestic workers movement is a really a great source of inspiration. And with all the rich examples shared by uh, the Minister of Jamaica and by Myrtle Whitboy from uh, the International Domestic Workers Federation, but also from April uh, Sharp and Britta Lydia, um, I think we have a lot of um, important um, key steps on how we can call uh, all join this collective call for the wide ratification of ILO Convention 189. So. Thank you all, and um, I'm now passing on the floor uh, back again to uh, Chine Aurora. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marika. I'm not able to start my video though yet, just one second, just a technical issue. Okay, thank you so much. And, and thank you to the panelists for an incredibly rich and inspiring discussion. We indeed heard some really useful points on why the convention is so important and also some good practices on how to advocate for Convention 189. Oh, we also heard about some of the challenges uh, that domestic workers face in some of your countries and what we can do to push for ratification, which is exactly the subject of our report that we are launching today. Domestic work is work. Using ILO Convention 189 to protect workers' rights across the Commonwealth. You will find in this report case studies that inform good practice, inspires action, and raises awareness 
of the importance of ratifying this convention. It is hot on the virtual press this morning, and you will find a link to a copy of our report in the chat box. Our report includes case studies on five Commonwealth nations that have yet to ratify Convention 189, United Kingdom, Uganda, India, Papua New Guinea, and Dominica. These countries were highlighted because their governments have either committed to or are considering the ratification of Convention 189, or they have faced some pressure to ratify the convention, suggesting that there is momentum for change in those countries. Each case study focuses on the challenges that domestic workers face and also explores what governments and civil society can do to support domestic workers and promote Convention 189. The report also includes countries that have ratified the convention, Jamaica and South Africa. These stories of good practice provide insights into lessons learned and exemplify the power of strategic grassroots advocacy for bringing about essential change. So why, why ratify the, the Domestic Workers' Convention? Here are the reasons. First, the 10 year anniversary of the adoption of the convention should be a time for states to reflect, take stock and push forward the rights of domestic workers. Uh, second, the protection of domestic workers promotes gender equality and women's empowerment. Ensuring domestic work is an attractive employment opportunity lessens the burden of domestic work on women who currently do three times as much unpaid care as and domestic work as men and it allows more women to enter the workforce. Third, promoting the rights of domestic workers helps support the expanding care economy. We found that with aging populations and more women entering the workforce, demand is rising for care work, and we need to ensure that domestic, the domestic work sector is sufficiently attractive to potential workers. Fourth, support for domestic workers is, is more important than ever following the destructive impact of, of COVID-19. Uh, so in order to recover from the impacts of the pandemic and ensure resilience against future crises, we must ensure all workers have access to appropriate social protections. And finally, domestic workers, especially migrants, are at particular risk of contemporary forms of slavery, discrimination, and being denied the right to do some work. This means the implementation of the standards in Convention 189 is critical to help governments meet the UN sustainable goals, sustainable development goals by 2030. And this is particularly noteworthy uh, this year, the International Year for the Elimination of Child Labor. Uh, child labor is endemic in the domestic work sector where it, where it is particularly hard to tackle as it often takes place in private households and behind closed doors. So what can we do? Our report summarizes a few key actions that advocates have taken and can take to support domestic workers in their communities, but also in, to encourage their governments to ratify and implement the convention. First and foremost, it's vital to collaborate with domestic workers and organizations led by domestic workers in order to inform advocacy that is responsive and relevant. Uh, these organizations, of course, include trade unions. In, in order to ensure that our work is tailored to the realities of domestic workers, advocates must consult with them at every stage of the process. Second, we have heard some good ideas on how to engage decision makers in the push for the ratification and implementation of Convention 189. If appropriate in your countries, these can be done through parliamentary questions, private or public letters, or meetings with sympathetic government officials or parliamentarians who can be encouraged to raise the convention and the rights of domestic workers on their platforms. Next, we recommend the use of key dates as opportunities to strategically advocate and campaign for the ratification and implementation of the convention and the rights of domestic workers. For example, we are launching this report and bringing everyone together here today on Human Rights Day. Dates like this signify moments of collective action where organizations and individuals globally can rally around a single issue. In our report, we include a list of, of dates that are particularly relevant for collective action around domestic workers' rights. 
Next, we call on everyone to promote the ratification of Convention 189 and the implementation of its provisions through public awareness, education, and campaigns. For the government to recognize domestic work as work that warrants inclusion in all labor laws and social safety protections, uh, it, needs to, it needs to be sensitized accordingly, and also the wider public needs to be sensitized. Fifth, we suggest advocates also promote the right to information. Uh, we know that right to information legislation, where it does exist, obliges public institutions to ensure certain information about activities are accessible to the public, including civil society. Access to official records and data can inform evidence-based interventions and strategic advocacy efforts. Uh, six, and our speakers have confirmed this, that it is effective when we act collectively to join international and regional, even national civil society coalitions to raise awareness, amplify and advocate national issues at international and regional fora is very important. Uh, we all know that coalitions can enlarge audiences, but also amplify civil society voice. And in our report, we have a list of coalitions and networks in, uh, that you can reach out to. Um, in our report, and they can, um, and they include several representatives from today's online forum, including the, um, the IW, uh, I, so IDWF, and the Commonwealth 8.7 network. Um, seven, we urge supports to services and capacity building for domestic workers. So domestic workers, especially um, migrant workers, are often overlooked by agencies or organizations that provide aid, shelters, and emergency care. And so support should go beyond immediate needs in terms of crisis to also help and support domestic workers to thrive in the long term, building their capacity to advocate for their own needs. And finally, we recommend raising concerns with human rights experts and mechanisms uh, such as the United Nations Human Rights Council, including the Special Rapporteurs, the Universal Periodic Review Process, also the High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, which monitors the achievement of the SDGs. Regional bodies also have experts who can comment uh, on human rights violations or respond to complaints. So these are just some of the actions that we can take now. We need diverse voices and powerful coalitions to rise up, push for change, and hold our states to account. We hope that our report can be a resource to all of you in this endeavor. Again, you will find a link to our new report, Domestic Work is Work, in the chat box. Just trying to turn on my video here to make final remarks. There you go. So before I turn to um, closing remarks, uh, I just wanted to apologize again for the extremely rude and disrespectful, disrespectful interruption to our debate earlier. I agree with the Minister uh, in, of Jamaica and, and Myrtle and other panelists. We are not perturbed nor intimidated by those that wish to derail our efforts. Indeed, we will continue to go on in our struggles with passion and commitment in our work to protect the human rights of all. So thank you all for your understanding and continued support in this, uh, in this time. Thank you again. And I will now turn uh, the floor over to Owen Tudor, the Deputy General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation for some final words. Oh, uh, thanks very much indeed, Sne. Uh, difficult uh, webinar to, to run. And what a set of contributions from our speakers today. Thanks to all of them. And thanks to everyone who's joined us live and will be watching this online afterwards. I'm Owen Tudor. I'm Deputy General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, which represents 200 million trade union members worldwide. And I also lead the Commonwealth Trade Union Group with more than a third of those trade unionists. And I'm a member of the CHRI UK board. So I'm very pleased to be concluding the launch of this brilliant report. And many thanks to the CHRI staff who have produced it. This issue has always been a personal one for me. 
not just an expression of my lifelong trade union values, because my uncle and aunt were domestic workers in the UK in the days when one in six British workers was in service, as the euphemism had it. I want all domestic workers to have the same rights at work as every worker should have. I'm proud of the role of the trade union movement, although there is much more to do in organizing and empowering domestic workers. And proud also that uh, when the ILO considered Convention 189 and the accompanying recommendation 201, the organization I then represented, the TUC in Great Britain, sent a domestic worker to take part in the negotiations, Marisa Begonia, a fantastic organizer who I'm glad to pay respects to as I think she's on the call today. It was an absolute disgrace that the UK government was among a handful of governments abstaining on the adoption of the convention and that it has done so little since to improve the lives of domestic workers. Turning to the Commonwealth as a whole, I've long believed that it needs to become a Commonwealth of peoples, not just a Commonwealth of governments. And ratifying international human rights instruments like Convention 189 uh, that benefit people in the Commonwealth is a good way to demonstrate this. The convention is in force now in six Commonwealth countries. Great to see that Namibia joined that list just yesterday uh, and that three more have started the process. But those remaining 45 countries in the Commonwealth that have not yet ratified the convention or started on the journey to do so need to get on with it now that it is 10 years old. COVID-19, as the report shows and many speakers have said, has demonstrated how vital domestic care work is, but has also shown how vulnerable domestic workers are. We need to invest in the care economy, give domestic work the recognition it deserves and provide domestic workers with the rights and capability to organize for their own freedom from insecurity, poverty, and in the worst cases, slavery and trafficking. And finally, we need to organize and empower domestic workers and work with them to ratify and implement Convention 189 and Recommendation 201 across the Commonwealth. I pay particular tribute to Jamaica's Employment Minister, Carl Samuda, who spoke earlier, because of his answer to the opening question of why Jamaica was one of the first Commonwealth countries to ratify the convention which was, it, which was that it was the campaigning work of the Domestic Workers' Union run by Shirley Price. We must all support domestic workers as they fight for their rights, and the report that CHRI have launched today is a key step in providing people with the tools to make that happen. Thanks very much to everyone who's contributed to the report and to this uh, webinar, but also to the struggle for domestic workers' rights around the world. Thank you, let's get on with it. Thank you, Owen. A note of thanks to Owen, Marie Kay and the ITUC. This event and our, our report would not have been possible without the support and partnership of the International Trade Union Confederation and the Commonwealth Trade Union Group. I wish to also extend my deep appreciation to our esteemed speakers, uh, to uh, all the delegates who are here today, as well as my incredible team at CHRI London who worked tirelessly to produce this publication and bring us here today. In this, um, in this time of, of great uncertainty and increased vulnerability for domestic workers, it is essential that diverse voices from across the Commonwealth come together like we have today and push to protect these valued members of our societies and our communities. I wish you all a very peaceful holiday season. Stay safe. Thank you all and goodbye until next time.